Today in the studio, I've got a bona fide CEO. I say bona fide because you look like one. <laughs> yes, sir. Like if you guys, if you guys, you know, close your eyes and imagine a CEO, Todd Skelton is what one looks like. There we go. And quite frankly, you are one, have been one from a, for a, for a multi-billion dollar organization. Yes. Um, you started in Pizza Hut though. Pizza Hut, man. Yeah, yeah, tell that story. I see it in the green room. You were telling me that story. I almost want to say, save it for the mic. <laughs> we could tell it again, man. We could tell it again. Yeah. So listen, uh, I, I, what I didn't tell you is I grew up, uh, I grew up in New Orleans. Uh, you know, I didn't have, uh, we didn't have much, right? I would say probably did lower you know, middle class. Did you know Grant Cardone? I, I, oh no, he was from. He's from Lake Charles. Yeah, Lake Charles. But interesting, uh, Elena grew up about five miles from me. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she sure did. So uh, we've been we've become pretty good friends with those guys, and I, I learned that that one recently. But uh, look, man, I grew up in uh, in New Orleans. I I was a typical kid, you know. Read your book, and you know you get jobs early, and you go out and you want to win. And I mowed lawns and you know that type of stuff, and started at sixteen. And then I got in the Pizza Hut business as a cook. That was my first real job. After I've been fired as a bus boy and fired as a waiter because I was too young and, you know, probably did not handle it right, right? And uh, I went from a Pizza Hut, uh, you know, cook to a shift manager and then and it was time for me to be a manager where there was a problem with that. It was also time for me to go to college. And uh, University of New Orleans, I enrolled and Pizza Hut came to me and they said, hey, listen, uh, you can't imagine this would happen today, but they said, hey, listen, here's the deal. You can either go to college or you could be a, our first youngest, um, you know, Pizza Hut manager. I said, wow, that sounds exciting, but why can't, why can't I go to college? Well, because we need 50 hours a week out of you. It's just not going to work. We've tried this before. It doesn't work. So I chose the, the money, right? And uh, told my parents I couldn't find a parking space at University of New Orleans. So the, the truth of the matter is, the blonde over here, my wife, didn't know this story until about two months ago. And uh, 10 years together, I never told her that I didn't finish school. Cause I was, uh, I was embarrassed. And then I went to Cardone's. Imagine how I feel. <laughs> I went to Cardone's, uh, you know, growth con and I watched four billionaires in a row get up on the stage and say they didn't go to college. And I thought, well, shit, I mean, this must be okay. So I went back to the hotel room and I told her, I told her the truth. So, uh, I traded college for, um, you know, education for, for the money, yeah. for the opportunity. Now, thank God I did. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that college is not a good place, but for me, it was the right path. Makes sense. Yeah. So, but you quit, you end up quitting. They said you couldn't go. They, they yeah. how'd you quit pizza hut? Yeah. So no, I joined Amway, man. Oh and, yeah. Amway. And if you ask me where I learned my, learned my social skills and how to close people and how to do things that, you know, get people to do things they don't want to do for, for money. It was Amway. They taught me all that stuff. I who, built a huge Who recruited group. you? Um, a guy who was in the car business recruited me into Amway, oddly enough, which is really where the story kind of plays out. And uh, I did that business and I had, I don't know, about 100 people in my group and I wasn't making any money at it, but I learned a ton, man. I would leave my Pizza Hut job in South Florida and I'd get in the car and I'd drive to Orlando, two and a half, three hours, and I would do a meeting. And in, in Amway, you're trying to sell people on the dream, right? We're going to sell them on the dream. And I get in the car at about, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, I drive back. And I remember driving down the road on the turnpike with the window open, slapping myself in the face to stay awake. Happened all the time. So Pizza Hut decided they didn't want me to do that anymore. And I said, well, I, I, I do want to do that. So what are you going to do? And they said, well, you got to quit that. And I said, I'm not going to quit. And they said, well, we'll accept your resignation. But, but I'm not quitting. Well, that's okay. We'll accept your resignation. Okay, cool. So they accepted my resignation, which I never actually gave them. And uh, I went out and decided that I would talk to my friend from Amway and, and he would tell me where to go next. And he said, dude, you got to get in the car business. Like you'll be amazing in the car business. So I went to my local Chevy dealer in uh, Green Acres, Florida, which is in West Palm Beach, where I bought my cars and they turned me down. We have no interest in you. I went in, I went dressed. I, maybe that was the problem. We don't have any interest in you. You're, you're a green pea, as they call them in the car business. And I went back a second time. But while I was doing this, I had to do something. So I had another friend who was in Amway who sold meat out of the back of a truck. You can't make this stuff up, man. So I got in the back of a van and we went and sold frozen meat door to door 
to people that had no idea we were coming to try to sell them frozen meat. So for six months, I sold frozen meat out of the back of a van while I continued to go into that auto dealership. And finally, on my third attempt, I ran into the general manager, Bill Lanigan, never forget the guy. And he goes, you know what? I see something in you. Let's do it. And it was funny because all those sales managers, there were four of them that told me no. The day I started, he fired every one of them, not because of me. But it was just ironic how I had a whole brand new set of sales managers on the desk. The ones that told me no, they didn't stay. That's funny. Yeah. Dude, the car business, I grew up in that, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. If you read my book, I don't know if I talked about that much, but. Uh, a little bit. Yeah, you, you, you definitely talked about how you made more money. Yeah, so I was 17, legally 17, and I went into a car dealership after basically getting my ass kicked on a fire crew you know, hard, hard work up in Oregon. So I went in the first day on the job and got it. And next thing you know, man, I'm getting to wear a suit, wear cologne, you, you know, got a car. They gave me a free That's car. I, I, couldn't, the I book. couldn't believe it. It you was like, holy moly, dude, they're giving me a car. This, these other ones want me to have poison Oak. Right. These guys want me to have a trans am, right. which one do you think I picked? <laughs> So my first month, I think I did like six, 8,000. This was back in the day. That was pretty good. And I was working at a store where everybody was like a, you know, we call them floor whores. They just sit around yeah. and wait. Right. And, and I wasn't waiting for anything. Customer came on the lot. Boom. I'm up in their grill. And I was the new kid just killing everybody. Well, I was only 17 and I had told a few people I was only 17. And, and so they tell the GM that, mm. hey, Brad's not 18. So I get called into the office and he sits down. He says, how many cars you got out? Or no, he says first, uh, Brad, uh, how old are you? And I could tell. <laughs> and I, and I said, why? And he says, how old are you? And I said, well, almost 18. And he said, um, how many cars you got out right now? And I said, 16. This was like on the 10th of the month. <laughs> He said, uh, when do you turn 18? I said, I think, you know, maybe it was a couple of weeks or a month or something. And he said, uh, you think you can keep your mouth shut that long? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah. And he said, all right, quit telling everyone you're 17. Get out there and sell some cars. He didn't say shit. And I'm like, dude, this is a cool business. Right. So I stayed in it for a long time. But yeah, the car business, I still miss it. Do you? I mean, I'm so fresh out of it, man. It's, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, listen, I stay in it. Uh, I read all the publications. I still get automotive news. I want to know everything that's going on. It gets ingrained in you. Well, not yeah. only that, but like, you know, you might get a call back real quick. Cause every time, so what happened? How did you, how are you not doing it now? Yeah. So, so what happened was I worked, um, in that same dealership, right? I made my way through all the different levels of the organization and right before I was a general manager, uh, this new company called AutoNation formed. Wayne Heisinger formed yep. AutoNation, right? And my dealer was friends with the first dealer group that they actually signed on, which was Maroney, Mike Maroney. Mm -hmm. And they were friends. And he came to my guy, Steve Moore, and said, hey, listen, this new company's coming out. They're buying everybody. So I'm telling you, to this day, Steve Moore sold that location, in my opinion, out of fear. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to be left with nothing, right? So AutoNation comes in and they take over. Now I'm an official employee of AutoNation. And some six or eight months later, I end up being the general manager of this first store. And then they put me in. I remember Mike Maroney taking me. There's a little life lessons here. Mike Maroney takes me and he says, hey, I got, I got an opportunity for you. I want you to go run this big Ford store. I go, but Mike, I'm running this big Chevy store and it's five minutes from my home. He goes, I, I understand that, but, but I want you to go run this Ford store. Well, this big Ford store was number three in the country, had been. And it dropped to like number 20 in the country because the GM running the store had the old culture and wasn't accepting the, the new culture of AutoNation. And so with this major conflict in the business, I said, no, he came at me a second time. I said, no. And then he said, hey, let's go to dinner. And I know I was screwed. So we went to dinner and he says, listen, man, you could stay comfortable in that chair, running that Chevy dealership, making the six, $7 million a year that that store makes, or you can get off your ass and go do this assignment that I need you to do. Well, I wasn't going to say no a third time, but what was smart about it is I made sure I didn't go in that, in that, you know, rabbit hole myself. I took three, the three of us went in myself, my general sales manager and my, my CFO, my controller. They didn't want to give me the controller. I said, I'm not going. So I held, I kind of held the cards, even though, you know, it was their company. And I went to this place and we went from 22nd in the country 
back to number three the third month we got there. We changed the culture in the store. But I guess the lesson there is, the bomb there is, you don't do it yourself, right? You got to bring somebody with you when you go there. That is a bomb. You're not going anywhere by yourself. I say that all the time. Absolutely. Well, it's a good thing that you had the people to take with you, though. Right, right. What if you didn't have them? um, And, hey, you know what, Brad? The interesting thing is these are guys that I got from Pizza Hut that followed me from Pizza Hut. Right. Oh, so they were your team team. They were my team. There were yeah. a couple of guys. And then, and as I think back to it, every step I took, which we'll talk about, every step I took, they took a step up and followed right behind me down the road. And there were two of them. Where are they at now? Back at Pizza Hut? Uh, no, they're still in the car. Well, one of them, one of them's in, in uh, Cox Automotive, which is still in the car business, yeah. right? Working for V Auto. And the other one is still is a general manager making himself a couple million bucks a year. Wildly successful, doing well. Beato still in biz. Beato was still in biz. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. I know. I know the founder of that. What's his name again? Dale. D- Dale Pollock. Yeah, Dale Pollock. Yeah, yeah. They were on. The, he credits me in a book he wrote, and and one time he told me, but uh, we had him on Lightspeed Beato in the very beginning. Oh, you did. And, yeah, and he said that was the that was his ability to scale because he had training. Normally, they'd go in and take two three days to get a store going. Right. But we put it all on light speed back then. Uh, and literally, he could train thousands of stores. And Viato yeah, blew up, and he sold it. And, sta- and stayed on. He's still there with him. Is he? He's still there man, with him. Man, how big is that company now? Oh, my God, it's huge. I mean, they own. They have Mannheim. They, there were so See, many. Dale Pollock's smart as hell. He's a brilliant guy. You know, it's, you know what's crazy also? I, mm. I, at one point in time, invented a lease presentation that I trained car dealers. That's how I started this company. But uh, it's called The Real Deal. The Real Deal, yeah. So I, I trademarked the name Real Deal. Well, turns out I get a phone call out of the blue. Dale Pollock says, Brad. I'm like, what's up? He says, hey, we, we, I'm in some trouble. I'm like, what? He said, basically, in a nutshell, he just spent all this time and money developing the software they call The Real Deal. Oh, oh no. <laughs> and he goes, and I ran a trademark search. And, and to my surprise, uh, you already have it. And I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So he said, is there any way that I can just co-license that from you just to make sure we don't have to scrap all this? And I said, of course. So I made him a little deal and, and let him use it. But it was, it was, uh, what, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And they weren't very big at all. Right. Huge. They got huge. I should have held out for bigger money. Hey man, listen, <laughs> 83% of the, uh, franchise auto dealers use that product. Yeah. 83%. But that's the, that's the software that basically tells you what the used cars are going for. It does. It tells you everything. It yeah. makes you as good as any whiz bang, cool Carvana or anybody else that gets in the game that thinks that they're going to disrupt that business, which it'll get disrupted eventually, but not right now. Yeah. Not right now. So how long ago were you with auto nation? So June of 2019, after enduring a 17 year relationship with a guy that I really didn't get along with, right? I'm this, I'm this market president, right? So I have this territory of dealerships. I've got different parts of the state of Florida. They keep moving my franchises around and I'm working for this one guy who ended up being the COO of Auto Nation. What's his name? Not Jim, Jeff, not Jeff Rocker. No, I know Jeff Rocker. No, it's not Jeff Rocker. Jeff Rocker's with who? Sonic? Uh, no, Jeff Rocker is with, um, see everybody on the podcast in the car business is saying it now, now, uh, uh what's his name? Warren Buffett's company. Yes. Berkshire Hathaway. Yes. But that wasn't Sonic. That was Van Tile. Uh, Van Tile. There yeah. you go. You got it. Van Tile. Rocker's he, he's crazy. I mean, he's just, he's just certifiable crazy. What he puts people through is kind of like this, this, uh, David Coggins you know, book that I'm reading. It reminds me of that. I mean, this guy is, is an impossible but he pays, he pays people well. They don't, they don't last long, but he pays them. Um, so listen, man, 2000, June of 2019, it's time for me to finally leave auto nation, but I got this problem. I got a non-compete. I get this phone call from, I'm, I'm entertaining a, a deal down in Texas with an upstanding individual, Mac McCarthy. And we talked back and forth about me being his COO, uh, replacing a guy by the name of, um, Oh, it was, it was a guy that used to run Toyotas. He was, a, he was a, a pretty big deal at the time and they kind of slid him out and I was going to take that job. But, um, you know, 
something was just keeping that thing a little bit on the, on the back burner. So I, you know, they were interested. I was interested. Come to find out that company takes forever to make a decision. And that's what happened. Meanwhile, I'll get a call from Kevin Westfall. Kevin Westfall founded Vroom and used to be an auto nation executive. He also founded BMW financial. This is a smart dude. He's like, Hey Todd, I heard you left auto nation. This is like the day after we're in the bathroom in Maryland where I had moved to with auto nation. I took the bride from South Florida to, to Maryland. That was not a fun discussion that day. Uh, she was not happy with me. A lot of crying and gnashing of teeth. Kevin's like, hey, man, I need a CEO. I go, you need a CEO for what? He goes, well, I just took over this company. And, uh, and, and, and it's a problem. Man. And, and we, we, you know, we're, I think we got a bad guy in the, in the mix here, and, and I'm going to need some help. So stay tuned. And he tells me what he's going to pay me. He gives me the pay plan. I'm like, all right. She says to me, hey, who, who was that? I go, ah, no, never mind. It can't be for real. Two days later, I'm relaxing because I hadn't had a vacation in, you know, all these years. I'm relaxing by the pool and I get another phone call. He goes, are you in or not? I go, are you serious? He goes, I'm serious. I go, all right, I'll be up there next week. I said, but we got this little thing called a non-compete. We got to work out. So sure enough, Kevin, who's friends with Mike Jackson, who's the CEO of AutoNation at the time, um, he says he's going to handle it for me. I said, all right. Well, the handling was we did six months versus a year. Fair enough. So January 1st, I start as the CEO of Prime Automotive, which was 56 car dealerships in the Northeast, $3.2 billion of revenue, completely broken, dysfunctional because the prior owner uh, was a family business and had sold the company to a private equity firm and they kept him as the CEO. Okay. So there's the picture. He's this figurehead within this organization, Prime Automotive. There's stanchions of him in all the dealerships. David Rosenberg, he's the man. And here comes this guy, Todd. They fired him in September. Here comes Todd from AutoNation, which is the last thing they want to know is how we're going to come and cookie cut their business, which they've heard all these bad things about AutoNation. And I got to make an impression on these people on how I'm going to help them and help this company, which is now currently under investigation by the SEC. So I took the job that I knew was going to be a mess, but I knew I could fix. Somehow, some way, I knew I could fix it because I had people with me. Again, that's the, that's the bomb, right? This time, it wasn't just me. It was Kevin pulling me in and a couple of other folks from, from the old AutoNation days. So we took it. January 4th of 2020, I became this, the president and CEO of, of Prime Automotive, the 10th largest auto retailer in the country. That was in shambles, you know, so. And now, and you're still with them? No. So basically what happened was we went through COVID. We went through a major IT breach where the, you know, the Russians got us and we had to pay all kind of money to get out of that deal. That's a crazy story. End of the month. They always hit you at the end of the month. They shut my dealerships down. They just shut them down. But we got through it. We figured it out. We got through COVID. We figured it out. The business starts doing well. And, um. We had a baby. We had a lot going on, man. COVID. During Congrats. during COVID, we had a home birth. You know, God bless these women. I don't know how she's. I don't know how you do it. A home birth, no drugs. No way. Yeah, that's crazy. Um. So so basically, here here's here's it in a nutshell. Everything's going great. The company's doing well. It was worth two hundred fifty million dollars when I got there in January twenty twenty. We think we're going to get out of this SEC thing. We think that the parent company GPB. David Gentile is going to negotiate with the SEC and get out of this deal, and we're going to be fine. This is what I'm telling 14 manufacturers that represent 50, uh, 56 auto dealerships, right? Now, picture this. Here we are, February 4th, in our board meeting, about to cover last year's performance and, and most notably Q4. And, man, I was pumped because I had really good numbers to present. I'm in this boardroom. I've got my CFO. I've got my CEO, uh, my, my, uh, my COO, and I've got Kevin Westfall. And then to the right of me, I've got five characters, good guys actually from GPB, the parent company. Mysteriously absent to my left in the seat is David Gentile, who owns GPB, right? He's the principal. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what are we going to do here? I mean, I knew the guy was in town from New York because he had dinner with his guys the night before in Boston. So we're up in Boston. And sure enough, it's 9 o'clock, it's 9.15. I said, I better get this show going. So I start the meeting without David, thinking, ah, David's just running a little late. It's David, you know. He's going to come in when he wants. By the time 11 o'clock comes, I've completely forgotten 
that David's not even in the room because I'm so into my slides, man. I had prepped. I was ready to go. I was in the zone, right? And I'm going. And all of a sudden, my phone is bzz, 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 bzz. So I, I excuse myself. I give the meeting to the CFO. I walk out of the room and I look at the text. 911, urgent, call me now. You know, just red, and the phone's just blowing up. So I call our PR lady who had been managing us through this process. And she goes, David Gentile was just criminally indicted by the SEC. He turned himself in in Boston. Boom. That's an interesting day. Now, yeah. <laughs> so listen, my CEO brain went from exciting and exuberant about the results we had to, oh my God, heart to the feet. I mean, listen, I've been through a lot, but this was new. This was a whole new thing. I didn't know, I didn't know what we were going to do. Went back in the room, got myself composed. And it was days later that I'm sitting in, a, in my office and I'm thinking to myself, man, what's the biggest challenge in this whole thing? The biggest challenge is how in the world am I going to attract and retain my best people during this? Because we got to keep this company going, man. I can't, I can't just let this thing go. We got, we got stuff to do. So we got David out of the company. Uh, they, they, they removed him. I was able to hold the manufacturers together by letting them know that we were going to sell the company. So now here's Todd who has to go out and figure out how I'm going to tell all these employees, over 3,000 of them, that, hey guys and gals, it's going to be okay. But you know, what got me there? Authenticity and trust, because the day I walked into the company, I started going out into the field and I started doing these town hall meetings. So it was three minutes about Todd, and it was three minutes about what our plan was going to be, simple three-step plan and what we were going to do to, to get the company going forward. And one of those steps was to make it the best places to work in whatever city that we, that we were operating in. And they're looking at me like, yeah, right, sure. And they didn't trust me at first. But every time I did that and I asked them questions and I bribed them with Dunkin' Donut cards, man, like, like okay, guys, who's got a question? Somebody's got to have a question for me. You start throwing out the $5 Dunkin' Donut cards. It's amazing who's going who's gonna to start to talk. And here it comes. Our IT department sucks. Do we even have one? What about this? What about that? That's been broken. This has been broken. And I got my team taking notes. So here's the key. We leave the meeting and I say to these guys, listen, I don't care what else you do today. You take the top two or three things that are fixable and you do them within 24 hours. You fix those things right now because this is on me. This is my word. And as soon as they went back and they did it and they fixed the stuff and they did the things that, that, that we said we were going to do, the next time we showed up for a town hall meeting, it was a little easier. And the next time it was a little easier, but I kept doing them. So think about when the company's under federal investigation, this guy's all screwed up and, and probably going to jail. We got to sell the company. But now Todd goes out and tells the story to the stores. It's going to be okay. Why did he go to jail? Well, he's, he hasn't been, he's, st he's still going through the process. He's but what, not what, what are they accusing so, him of? $1.8 billion Ponzi scheme. Ponzi. Ponzi. So basically, what he did was, he went and got investors, he signed them up, and this is all legend, obviously. He went and signed them up, he raised money, he paid an 8% an return, and that all went well at first. And then they went and they raised so much money that they started buying assets just to spend the money. Well, that never ends well. They didn't do proper diligence. We had one group of deals that they bought up in upstate New York that this thing was bleeding money when I got there. I mean, this thing cost us over $50 million when we sold it. I mean, it was it was a disaster. They never should have bought it. They had some, some kid in the back who's probably pretty smart, but didn't understand the auto business, doing the diligence on these deals, and they just went and paid all this money for these deals. So once the business started going south, <clears throat> The 8% returns were no longer there. So what's a guy to do? Well, let me take from the new guy's money and let me pay the other guys the 8%. That's called a Ponzi scheme. Yep. So that's what happened. Instead of just being honest in one of the chapters in your book, just tell the freaking truth, man. Hey guys, we're having a tough time right now. We'll get it fixed. But that's not what they did, right? Allegedly, that's not what they did. So this cat's uh, in big trouble. And uh, I got I got assigned an SEC monitor. E. Yeah, Joe Gardamel, another New Orleans guy. He comes in very guarded. He was appointed by the court system. And all of a sudden, Todd's got to report now to an SEC monitor. 
Well, as it turned out, Joe Field uh, found out pretty quickly that of all the $1.8 billion, we had pretty much all the money in the auto side. We were 62, 63 percent of the of the funds. There were seven funds, and our our two funds had the majority of the, of the assets, and they were sellable. So after about thirty days, when he when all the words like receivership and bankruptcy left, can you imagine going to these auto manufacturers and they're and they're seeing the words in the press that say receivership or bankruptcy? I was scared to death. They think the doors are going to get shuttered, so they want to shutter my doors. We kept them together. They believed me, they trusted me, and we went through a sale process um, using Jeffries, an auction basically, and we sold the company for a billion. So we went from 250 and we sold it for a billion. But the best part is, this is all in November of 2021, 23 months after I got there with all this scandal and chaos, we were also awarded the Boston Business Globe Best Places to Work. We won that award. So, so the employees in the company, in the middle of chaos, still love their job. That's that's the most notable thing of the whole deal. That's good. That was good. You're, I can see that you're proud of that one. I, I, that and that and getting the investors their money back, which is coming. That's that's even bigger. That that's even bigger. But I'll tell you, did you you got a little piece of that billion dollars? Well, yeah. I mean, I, yes. Nice. <laughs> of course. Was that good news? That was that was amazing news, man. It was. You know, you look at that thing, I go back to February 4th and you say to yourself, how in the world is this going to end? I just moved my family from South Florida to Maryland and from Maryland to Boston. We built a new home. We thought this was going to be the deal. And the whole thing's just blowing up. I mean, I'm looking at this bomb picture behind you and it's, it was like that. But yet somehow, some way, you just keep doing the thing, man. You just keep doing it. You keep believing that there's got to be a way out and you keep problem solving. Every day we solved another problem. Every day we solved another problem. And so, well, hell yeah, but not just did I get a piece of it. The general managers got a piece of it. My executive team got a piece of it. And the investors get, if not all, much of their money back. Nice. Yeah, man. So, so, and that's recent. That's like November of 2021. Yeah, so since then, what happened? So um, I stayed on. The company was sold in November. I stayed on through December uh, in an advisory role just to, to kind of help, you know, put things together. Um, during the, the, it's amazing how things happen. I get a phone call from a guy right about the time when we sold to Group One, and I kind of realized through some coaching, uh, talking to a couple different uh, of my coaches, that this probably wasn't going to be a good gig for me to go from CEO to come and fix this big old company going back to working for somebody else. They basically said to me, it's not going to work, Todd. Like, it doesn't really matter what they offer you. It, it ain't going to work. I said, all right, well, let me just see what they have to offer. But meanwhile, out of the sky drops this guy who's starting a, a big truck business, a heavy-duty truck business. There's He's going to roll up auto truck uh, or big truck businesses just like the auto industry did 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So he, he did it on a small scale up in New England, and he did so well that now the funding institutions want to give him money. They want to do it again. And he wants to do it big this time. He, he got one manufacturer the first time. Now he wants to do it big. So he finds me at the perfect time. So I talk to him and he knows that I haven't made a final decision on whether I'm going to stay or not. And we go back and forth and back and forth. This went on for about three months. And I finally said, okay, dude, I'm ready. I'm not going to do this other gig. Let's, let's put this together. Never, never even talked about money. And as it is, and as it was, and as it'll always be, if you, if you manifest it, and you know it's going to work, it's going to work. And it worked. We ended up putting a deal together, which now will allow me to go and build this truck company with some of the same cats that we did the other deal with, because I'm bringing them with me. And we're going to build and scale this big truck company and roll these deals up. In about four to five years, we're going to sell it or go public. And then I'm going to exit. And I'm going to go out on the road and I'm going to speak and I'm going to tell a story. Because I got a lot to offer about retaining and, and hiring the best people. How do you do that? Man, listen, there, there's some, as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is, is we, I've gone back and I've started a process of, of what you do. And I think it starts at the simplest level of what you do when an applicant comes in. And I'll tell you a little story. Back in the auto nation days, in the later days when I was in, when I was in Maryland, I had, I had a, a meeting with 15 general managers and we're doing well, but we got a big problem. And the problem is we don't have any good people. And we're not getting good applicant flow, right? So these GMs are going to town on my VP of HR, just going to town on her. And I jump right in. Yeah, I mean, isn't that your responsibility? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take care of my guys, right? 
So after the meeting's over, she doesn't say much. After the meeting's over, she comes up. She goes, hey, Todd, uh, when's the last time you actually went and looked at the application tracker system? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. She goes, come on over here. And I knew I was in for an ass whipping, man. We went in the system. Brad, I kid you not, 15 dealerships. There were 300 applicants sitting in the system that hadn't been touched, some of them for a month. So I made the critical mistake of listening to these guys and not doing what I needed to do, which was to go look at the details of the deal. And this is the one of the things that I'm going to teach when I go out on the road is, I don't care who you are, what CEO level you are, you better inspect that system, that process, and make sure it's getting handled, right? So I put 11 steps together of what you do with an applicant to make damn sure that you get the best shot at those people. That's what I do. And I'll tell you, I'm going to give you the top three, and then we're going to put a link up at the end. People can download this, this full list. But the top three are, the first thing you got to do is you got to respond to these people. So that was a lesson I learned, right? And you got to respond fast. In today's market, when you talk to recruiters and agencies, who well, I've got a lot of friends in that business, man, if you're not on the phone with these people within minutes or sending a personalized email, not these you know, not, and you know, and what you do, you, you gotta, it's gotta be something that these people feel good about when they get it right. Not, not an out of the box email, right? Not an auto generated email. That's the first thing you got to make contact. The second thing is you got to tell them what's going to be next. Like you got to go through the list and say, okay, here's what's going to happen next. You got to see if they're breathing because in most cases I'm interested in a cultural fit, not necessarily where they went to school. And the third thing is, once you get past that, you need to get these people in immediately, like three days maximum. You got to get them in front of you so that you got a standing chance because the world out there is after these folks and they got offers coming at them left and right. So those are the top three. Mm. Boom. Give you another bomb, bit dizzle there. You know, back in the day when I started this company, Lightspeed, now have you heard of Lightspeed mm -hmm. in the car business? So we ended up having thousands of dealerships on it, but most of them aren't using it correctly. Right. You know, when I was closing AutoNation, if AutoNation would have just did the deal and, and like listened to me, which I was younger at the time, that I don't blame them for not, but uh, I'll bet you I could have made them more money than they made on their own, simply through training effectively. No doubt. Because, because you know, I ran dealerships too. I didn't go as high as you, but I got to the top of the dealership chain and, you know, I could take people off out of Burger Kings and turn them into salespeople. I'd, I'd literally go shopping for shoes or whatever. And I'd recruit right out of the stores and I'd turn them into, you know, badasses making 15, 20 grand a month, just like this. And so when I quit that, I went out on the road to, to, you know, start my own. That's when I was going to compete with guys like Grant. And so, that's when I invented the real deal lease presentation, which I believe still is the most effective lease presentation there is. Um, it can get someone to be willing to lease overnight. So I thought I'm going to go do this to help other people make money. Well, it didn't work very well. And that's what caused me to see that in training, there's four things and most dealerships miss them. You have to have good content, which is the right way to do it. Right. A lot of dealerships have that, but then you need repetition. They're not doing that. There's no practice. They're, they're not doing that. And there's no accountability. They're not doing that. So the four things that are required to make it training aren't usually being implemented at these dealerships, at least at the employee level where like, you know, I hire a salesperson. We had the dumbest policies. You know, you, you, you had to wait until the HR department had their next, you know, thing before you could get fresh batch of salespeople in stupid stuff. But I, if I were going to build you know, a massive agency, I would look at and focus on training. Don't you think? Oh, listen, uh, I, I, you're making me think back to when I went and started that Chevrolet, that job at that Chevrolet dealership. Now you don't think that these Jamokes were going to teach me anything. They wanted to send me up and have me watch, you know, two year old VCR tapes. And I'm not kidding, by the way, thank God for Pat Ryan and associates. They had Pat Ryan come in and you can picture the room. You got all these salespeople in the room that don't want to be there. They don't feel like they need to be there. And you got me, the young buck who's like, teach me, teach me, teach me. I remember one day I had my first customer and I didn't know exactly what to do next. And I went upstairs and I got that guy out of the room that was teaching a class. And I said, you're coming with me. He goes, what do you mean? I'm teaching a class. I go, no, no, bro. You said it's important. I closed my first deal. Let's go. And I brought that cat downstairs and sat him next to me and we closed that car deal. 
because he told me he was going to be side by side with me and I made him do it. Nice. And that car deal, man, is what I did the same thing as you did. I made six to eight grand my first month in the car business and I sold, I don't remember how many I sold, but I remember saying after that class, telling the, the number one salesperson, Bonnie Bruce, who'd been there forever. She said, how many are you going to sell this month? I said, I'm going to do 20. She goes, now listen, son, you can't talk about that kind of stuff. They're going to think you've lost your damn mind. You're not going to sell 20 cars your first month. I sold 21, right? And I made more money than she did. She was some kind of pissed. But to your point, if not for that training, I, I don't know what would happen. I, I have no idea. But yeah, it's, it's, and people don't want to do it in the car business. They want the path of least resistance, unfortunately. And I look like a, a guy, and I know you know him, a, a, a good friend of mine, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Benstock. And Brian runs the number one Honda dealer or owns the number one Honda dealer in the country. And he's all about training and process. I mean, that, that dude's an animal when it comes to training and process. And that's why he's so successful, you know? That's right. Another bomb dizzle. <laughs> training, folks. If I could, If anybody's running a team right now, you want to increase your productivity, go fix your training because most people think they have a good training system when they don't. AutoNation missed big, big. time. Like, I, well, I missed. I should have closed it myself. That's my fault. But, you know, in those huge corporate meetings, I'd get flustered. You know, this person's got to talk to this person. You know, I'm a car guy. I'm, I'm wanting to close a deal, you know, but it kept getting bounced to this committee and that committee and blah, blah, blah. One time we flew out to, Fort Lauderdale, I think it was, yeah. to talk to Mike Jackson. Right. Um, there was three other people. I forget this one guy's name. I, um, he, he quit there a while after, and we kept in touch. Tom, I think his name was. He's a, he's a, he was a, I don't know. I, I think Tom, I think Tom might have been the Amway guy. Actually, uh, oddly enough that you say his name. He wasn't there long. I'll be damned. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he, he finally called me and said, no, they're just going to make their own. Uh-huh. And and I watched and listened because I knew GMs that work for AutoNation, and I'd watch and listen and watch for, and listen. And three years later, I called my buddy at AutoNation and be like, dude, you guys got a system yet? They're like, nope, nope, nope. It's one's coming, one's coming. And I haven't heard to this day that they've ever came out with one. Well, they don't. You know, they don't. And that's part of the problem. You remember, I'm 27 years there. So I watched this show over and over again. And they did the same thing with their with their CRM tool. They, they wanted to build their own and they did. And it was like DOS based, right? We're talking about a few years ago, they're still using this program. And the problem was, and thank God, by the way, you didn't get their business because they would have wanted you to do the craziest, stupidest customization on your product that made absolutely no sense, but that's what they had in their minds that needed to happen. And you would have walked out of there frustrated. You remember auto town? No. Came uh -uh. up, it came out for like a split second. It was like cool op dealer operating system. Okay. But then Reynolds and Reynolds. Oh yeah. Reynolds you know, and Reynolds. That thing was archaic. Big time. Well, they all are. CDK is still archaic. So, know? so this new truck deal, is it just like big semi trucks? Yeah. Semi heavy duty trucks. Dealerships though? Dealerships. So you're so, selling them. Yeah. So we have, so he's got uh, a private equity partner has um, Allegiance, which was the first group that he formed. And there's 36 or 37 of those dealerships, primarily international. Well, those the, are good investments nowadays. They're great. They're amazing. I mean, even, even owning a truck. Yes. You can even own, you can even buy a truck and then literally hire a company to dispatch and, 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 and use it and make money. And, and well, listen, I mean, uh, I did it. I did an Instagram reel right before we came here. I did that with a jet. I mean, and, and you'll laugh at this. What, one of the things I talked, it was about an Instagram flex. One of the things I talked about is, yeah, we went out and bought a jet. I bought jet for tax reasons and business purposes, not for me to put my ass on a, on a flight from South Florida to here. That's just stupid. And, and, and the, the Instagram reel says, listen, my empire is not big enough for that yet, right? One day, sure. But right now, do we have a jet? We got a jet. I let other people fly on the jet. It makes me money. As soon as I get on, I don't make any money, right? And the same thing with the trucks, man. If you get the right truck and you put it in the right business use, you can make a killing on that thing. Yeah. Plus the tax advantages of it. Well, so you're in that position now though. Yeah. So if anyone listening wants a truck or, or, or to buy a truck, where should they go? Uh, they can just hit me up on, on the socials. Um, I'm at, I'm at Todd R skeleton.com is, is my website. Um, Todd skeleton CEO is the Instagram. It's best to just hit me up on Instagram. Cause I'm on that all the time following through there. S K E L T O N folks at Todd Skelton CEO. Well, that's crazy. You're going to eventually have a book. 
There's a book coming, man. This there story. I mean, there were so many people. We only have so much time. There's so many pieces to that story. Dude, you got a hundred more stories, I'm sure. Yeah. Dude, when I was in the car business, I mean, <laughs> the, the car business is unique, but man, there's a lot of dealers and principals and, you know, it's, it, it, it's how long you been around it? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, there's, it's a, it's a culture to it. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And dealers are funny, dude. You know, they'll spend money on the craziest shit and right. then and then stop when it's actually, you know, like they'll spend more money on toilet paper and balloons for the weekend than they will training their people. That's I used right. to close deals that way because I'd be talking to the GM and I'd say, dude, how much money do you spend in advertising? You know, 50000 a month. And I'd say, you're spending $50,000 to get them in the door, but you won't spend 1000 a month to train them? Oh, no, our sales manager's trained. No, they don't. It's like, come no, on, they dude. don't. It's stupid. <laughs> Sales managers don't train. Hey, so also earlier you were talking about something you're passionate about. What was that? Yes, I am the co-founder of an incredible community called The Mom Link. It is the largest, most valuable social network for mompreneurs to scale their business on the planet. Uh, I got a lot of moms listening to me. Yeah, we're all about collaboration over competition. Um, yeah, so... We're just very passionate about women empowerment and bringing women together. You know, a lot of times mompreneurs and women in business, we're operating in this silo. You know, we don't have, there's a lot of competition. We don't share resources or skills or tools or knowledge. Well, the mom link came to cancel that culture. Three moms who had a career gave that up to be moms and then, you know, kind of hit their forties, right? We're, we're just deciding, Hey, there's still more life in us. We want to have more impact met during a pandemic on a social audio app called clubhouse came together collaborated. Clubhouse. clubhouse are you on are you on breakout yet now uh, we're getting over there we actually todd knows the job. cody start cody yeah. 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 yeah breakout audio get over there yeah yeah so so we collaborated created the mom link uh grew our club to almost thirty thousand members wow. and now we've launched the mom link million dollar mom club with the help of our where mentor do where do people see that they see, they can go to Instagram. So they can go to Instagram and check us out at the mom link, or they can go to momlink.club and become a member. I wish we had a microphone on you. I'm hoping this picked it up all that. Yeah, uh, you did. You did one the other day where there was uh, somebody had their wife in here and you could hear Good. her comments. So, Good. cause that's worth hearing. You know, yeah. again, I don't think you go anywhere alone. If moms can link up, is that why it's called mom link? Exactly. Exactly. And, and so. become what entrepreneurial? Yeah, to, to scale their business. So yeah. moms who are in business, there's a, there's a, a unique set of circumstances with moms that are in business and, and becoming entrepreneurs. You wake up and you have one hat on that's the mom, you know, getting the kids ready for school or camp, packing lunches, feeding breakfast. Then you get on your phone and you're putting out fires with your business, you know, trying to grow a network. Everybody you know, wants a following. Everybody wants their product or service in front of the community. Well, we're ordinary moms that are mompreneurs that did something extraordinary. And that was build a huge community, a loyal following. So when you join the mom link, you're getting in front of all of these women who are sharing that specific set of unique circumstances who get it, right? They get raising kids, they get what it's like to start a business and we're helping each other share. We're giving each other our experiences, our skills, our resources, and now we're growing our businesses together because we can't do it alone. That idea of a self-made entrepreneur or, you know, um, solopreneur, that concept is bullshit. You need community. Just like Todd said, you need people. You need relationships. Money only comes from one source. That's people. That's right. Yeah, you need that. And so we, moms need that. Moms why why did you that. say it like that? Did you hear me say that? I say that all the time. She does. Podcast. She says it all the time. You know, but it's true. It it's so true. I tell people like relate money comes from relationships. So you want more money, get more relationships. You said it in the book over and over again. And I'll tell you something else. So these women started this deal on clubhouse and all they did was add value, add value. I, I listen to these rooms and all they're have doing I ever is been in, popped in one of your rooms. You should. I, have I ever? I don't on, think so. I'm on Clubhouse. I, I have like 30 some thousand followers. It's yeah, you, good. you you do have a lot of followers on Clubhouse. I'm, I'm hardly ever on it though. Like, <laughs> right? I, like, like, you know, I wanted to start rooms and stuff, but like yeah. that shit takes time. Like, well, you, we spent a lot of time and I'll tell you what, in the beginning he was like, get off that thing. You're addicted to that thing. And he had it. He was anti Clubhouse for a long time. What happened was he started hearing these women crying. Oh my gosh, I, you guys helped me. I found my place. I found my tribe. I can't believe this 
this community is doing what they're doing, the impact, and he would see that and hear that, and he's like, this is real. What you're doing is is legit. Like, I'm proud of you for that. And, nice. And we got him on Clubhouse, so now he runs room under CEO Central. Yeah, we got CEO Central that we do, and we get, and you know. Grant comes in, and Ben Stock comes in, and we have a whole crew that we go with. They're usually in the Million Marathon. Yeah, Million yeah, Marathon, Nelson. Nelson. I'm I'm a, I'm a friend of Nelson. I'm an investor with Nelson. Nelson's, he's, he's a 26-year-old kid. That's amazing. You should bring him in. Yeah, you, really you should bring him. That'd be a great interview. I'll get him He's in. He's 26 years old. And what, he, forget the million marathon. I mean, that thing's fun in itself. But what he's done behind it, I would never give somebody my money that doesn't have a solid. This dude's got an amazing business plan. He really does. Wow. It's good stuff. Yeah, man. Clubhouse was kind of kind of cool. But, you know, nowadays, every time I pop in there, it's like, it seems like it's just the people arguing. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely narrowed in and found our niche. Well, you started a tribe. Yeah, yeah they, they did. I say women don't have to fight for a seat at the table. We're making the table. That's right. We're creating the table. <laughs> That's right. Where, now, where do people go? If I got... Momlink.club. They can follow us on Instagram at the momlink, and you can follow me personally at the momerator. Momerator. The momerator. momerator. But mainly momlink.club. Yep. Momlink.club. So there you have it. Yeah, man. Dude, I hope, I'm, I'm glad you guys flew all the way in. Yeah, listen, it's better. It's better you, than you didn't, you didn't come just for this. You stay in a couple days. No, I'm out tonight, man. I'm busy. You just popping in and out, dude. From where? From South Florida. Holy shit! We'll, we'll get home at five. Uh, I'm sorry, ten in the morning. We'll take dude, the eleven o'clock out. Listen, for making that kind of trip, what kind of what can the bomb squad do for you? You know, listen, what we're trying to do right now, I'm trying to get my social network built up. Right, I got a great story to tell, as you can see. I think I can help a lot of people. Out of curiosity, why do you want your social uh, network built up? Because when we build and scale the company and sell the company, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give back. You know, my coach is Dave Meltzer, and if you're not following Dave, you need to follow Dave. And I'm going to do. He's a like lot. the nicest guru in the world. He is the smartest dude, and yet he's 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 impacting so many people, and he's building a huge community of of good folks, and and I'm. That's what I want to do. I mean, there's something to be said. That's so, what your so book's all so about. So you're a guru in the making. I'm a guru in the making. You're, you're wrapping up this one. You're going to transition out, and then you're going to go show other people how to do it. And so they don't have to make the same mistakes that yeah. I made. That's yeah. you, right? Yeah. At, in your book. That's yeah, what you're but, talking but, about. But you'll be what's called a real guru. A See, real? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's real ones, and then there's fake ones. Unfortunately, the fake ones give real ones a bad name sometimes. They do. You know, oh, you're trying to sell a course. Well, like, dude, all you got to do is look at whether someone has already accomplished something. Right. And that's how you can tell. Like, again, I mean, if I want to learn how to make $100 million, I don't want to learn from someone that's never made $100 million. So you've already done it twice now. As soon as this one, as soon as you're done with this truck business, right. that'll, that'll be what, two or th that'll be three. Well, it'll three. Be, that'll be two big exits and a, and a, you know, a, yeah. a 27 year career. Yeah, in dude. Space. You, you're, and I'm telling you with all that knowledge and the stories that you got, cause you're a storyteller mm -hmm. and it's all about stories. Stories sell. Right. That's what gets, you know, Amway going. Right. That's why I that's another, that's another thing. A lot of people say, you know, MLMs are full of shit. Cause like you said, I had a lot of people that I didn't make any money. MLMs, dude, I, I'm telling you, they're, they're totally legit businesses some of them obviously are scams but they're legit businesses the question is is how good are the products you, right. me, you remember one called monavi of course oh, yeah yes yeah, so, so like so like when that first came out there was no acai berries anywhere no, then right. it came then it came out at costco for cheap and it was like oh no more monavi yep. you're right i forgot about that one. oils hey those oils do you do oils? Yeah, we do oils. Yeah, but I Listen, legit companies and people make real livings off. those oils work. They do work. Now, now maybe not doTERRA. I'm sure they're the I same. If you ask, like dude, I know someone in France that has a, you know, oil farm or whatever, flowers, lilacs, whatever. You, they, they literally bring people over. This is what they told me. I'm not claiming I know this, but they bring people over and there's doTERRA farms. And then literally the next day they take down the doTERRA farms and it's young living farms. <laughs> and, and literally it's all the MLM saying, these are the farm. These are our farms. Right. When in reality, they're all getting the same shit. Yeah. Like right. doTERRA and young living oils, I, I fear are the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the who's marketing. Cause I've heard my wife, she doesn't do young living. She loves oils. Yeah. 
So she does the young living without even knowing she's right, doing right. it. Like I get, we get little checks in the mail. What the one time I, I filed uh, taxes and I'm like, and I got this notice. I'm like, what is it? And, she, and I'm like, babe, what's this 12,000 bucks? She goes, Oh, that's from young living. I'm like, <laughs> you, you made 12 grand. <laughs> and it turns out she made 12 grand from us buying all the oils. Right. <laughs> yeah, she, She'd be like, I got I had to buy all that to, to hit my bonus or yeah. some shit. And you know what? People, hit me up all the time and they're like oh you'd be great i want to get you on my monet team or you'd be great you'd sell this sell that and i've always said no to any of that because i was never passionate about it but with the mom link i'm so passionate about seeing other women win and succeed and accomplish their goals and get forward in life that this is something that i can get behind like, and we're gonna have to have her come back and she's got to come back man i'm telling you she's as a communication major, and, and she's on fire with I was going to say, like, she, she sounds like she's oh. a professional, you know, TV host or something. I have a degree in speech communication. Yeah. Interesting. Unlike me, who didn't finish because I couldn't find a parking space. Still makes more money than You look a little I smidge, know. like, cross between, like, Mariah Carey. And... Everyone's housing that. Mariah Carey, <laughs> J-Lo, I get some time. Yeah, you she's got, got time where she looks just like J-Lo. Yeah, you no, guys can't see her because it's just Todd on the, on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have you back. If you guys ever come back to yeah. Vegas, sure. I, I can't believe you just came all the way here and back, but I appreciate it's it. It's important, man. You're a big deal. Well, I don't I think... like your topics. Well, I appreciate it. And that's why we came. And the Bomb Squad's going to love you because you're authentic and you've done it. So, folks, go follow this dude, at Todd Skelton, CEO. Watch him transform the last business. Shoot him a DM. You wouldn't care if they DM you. 100%. Please do. And, and if you're out there listening and you want to hook up, you're a mom, entrepreneurial mom, go to momlink.club. Check it out. Is that clubhouse.club? But I mean, that's where everyone meets and talks. It's our website. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out. Absolutely. Folks, as always, till next time, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.